to Talk to Internal Audit, our dedicated Facebook Live series. Today's session is about auditing culture, and I'm joined by Sandro Boeri. Sandro is Head of Staff Development and Culture Assessments at Deutsche Bank. He is responsible for staff development for Deutsche Bank's global internal audit teams. He was one of the founders of Risk Audit with a career spanning 30 years in financial services, corporate governance in the City of London and internationally. His main area of specialism is in the field of internal audit, where after serving his apprenticeship during six years at Kleinwerk Benson, he went on to run the audit functions at Amsterdam Rotterdam Bank in London, Credit Agricol, Sumitomo and the Gerard Group. Sandro has also led the compliance functions of Credit Agricole and Sumitomo, as well as running the operation functions of Credit Agricole. Sandro is a prominent speaker on subjects ranging from corporate governance to motivation in the workplace. He has led major sessions on behalf of a wide range of companies including the Institute of Internal Auditors. So grab a tea and join me as we delve into auditing culture. Before I start though, may I introduce myself for those of you that are new and also introduce the Chartered Institute. So I'm Liz Sandwith and I'm the Chief Professional Practice Advisor at the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors UK and Ireland. The Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors is the only professional body dedicated exclusively to training, supporting and representing internal auditors in UK and Ireland. We have approximately 10,000 members in all sectors of the economy in all parts of the UK and Ireland. And our members are part of the global network of over 200,000 members in 170 countries. And we all work to the same international standards and code of ethics. May I also remind you that you can acquire CPE points for these Talk to Internal Audit sessions. So don't forget to log them using our CPE template. Details of how to claim CPE from this live stream can be found in the comments section. So going back to where I was at the beginning, Today's topic is about auditing culture, and we're really keen that it's a practical hands-on session. The culture of an organization drives how it conducts business and executes its strategies. All organizations have a culture, whether intentionally created or not. It is likely there are also subcultures within an organization especially if multiple locations exist. Each department or location may have its own unique culture aside from the overarching culture uh, of the organization as a whole. Global culture differences also affect the desired objective of an international, uh, sorry, an intentional organizational culture. One of Internal Audit's key responsibilities is to assess the adequacy and effectiveness of the internal control environment directly impacted by culture and the conduct that arises from employees acting out and exhibiting their interpretation of the values of that culture. Remember, if you like Facebook stream and want to spread the word, and I'm sure you do, be sure to share today's live stream. You can do that by clicking the share button in the corner of your screen. After all, the more the merrier. So may I just remind you, if you're just joining us, welcome to our live stream, Talk to Internal Audit. And today's session is about auditing culture, a practical hands-on session with myself and Sandra, Sandro Boeri, Head of Staff Development and culture assessments at Deutsche Bank. So let's stop a moment and think about culture. Often 
colleagues, I'm sure you will have heard, others will say that culture is quite difficult to define. So perhaps as a starter, we may define organizational culture and the conduct that occurs within that culture as representing the invisible belief systems, values, norms, and preferences of the individuals that form an organization. Conduct represents the tangible manifestation of culture through the actions, behaviors, and decisions of these individuals. Some regulators, mostly in the financial services sector, have issued guidance on their expectations for internal auditors regarding their assessments of culture and or cultural issues. Most organizations in industries such as manufacturing and energy, for example, are under no obligation to comply with such regulatory requirements. Indeed, they may even be unaware of their existence. So can I just give you a quote from a chief audit exec who said, an internal auditor increases their chances of understanding whether the culture is good or bad by being involved as observers in committees where management discusses information key to the organization's strategies. Internal auditors should be part of the enterprise risk management committee. And ideally, it is beneficial for chief audit execs to attend the executive committee meetings as observers. Internal auditors must develop the ability to use their eyes, ears and minds to watch people interact and think. If internal auditors are not engaged or embedded in the organization's governance entities to see those behaviors on a regular basis, then key performance indicators and key risk indicators related to culture may deteriorate, unknown to management. So without further ado, let's roll up our sleeves and have a practical conversation with my guest today. So welcome, Sandra. Hi, Liz. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me today. Quite looking forward to this conversation. Um, if, if, if I can sort of focus on, on what's provoked my interest in, in culture, Liz, uh, I've been an auditor for, as I think you quite interestingly articulated, for more years than I'd like to, uh, to, to, to think about. Um, well, one of the big scarring events in, in my life was the global financial crisis. And I saw a lot of damage done by the financial services sector to, to people I care about in this country, overseas. And then I really did have a meaning of life conversation with myself. As an internal auditor, what value if, am I adding? So I look back on all of the audit reports that I've written or participated in. I looked back on all of the wonderful audit recommendations that I've made. And I started reflecting on why don't management listen to my pearls of wisdom? Isn't that the logif logical, common sense thing to do? And then it, it became quite clear to me that management staff are what? They're actually human beings. And perhaps something that I've ignored through most of my career is what I call the human condition. So during... The, the latter phases of my risk audit project, I started uh, immersing myself in the human condition, trying to understand what makes human beings tick. And I wouldn't pretend to know the answer to that today, but what I do know is that we as a profession must find a way of engaging with, with culture, whether it's reporting on the culture that we see, measuring the culture that we see, or why stop there? Why not start to think about control processes that increase the chances that an organization may get the culture that it wants, may actually influence people to behave in a particular way. So that's what stimulated my, my interest in culture. So I, I believe that as a profession, we can 
capture data, report on that data, start to provoke conversations about culture. But I believe we can go further. I believe we can look at human behavioral controls. And I believe many functions are perhaps already looking at human behavioral controls without necessarily labeling these controls as such. Some good thoughts there, um, Sandro, and a, and a great introduction. And you um, reminded me of a CEO I worked with some years ago, and I was having a conversation with him about risk management, internal audit, culture, all of those sorts of things. And he just looked at me and he said, Liz, stop. You're making this all too complicated. He said, it is as simple as A, B, C. You need in your organization, the right attitudes, the right behaviors, and perhaps equally important consequences when people don't follow the values and the culture of your organization. And I thought, I like that. A, B, C makes it really quite simple. I like simplicity, but in my interactions with man and womankind, simplicity is perhaps not what I've found. Let me ask you a question, Liz. Um, have you always done what you've been told to do? No. W would you describe yourself as a rebellious individual? Not rebellious. No, I think that's a step too far, but not a blind follower. Okay. Well, if I look at the sector where I've spent most of my life, I, I'm certainly not surrounded by blind followers. I'm surrounded by investment bankers who are very assertive individuals. I'm surrounded by some, some very clever people who can be quite headstrong. So... Typically speaking, if you say to someone, I want you to read a procedure, I want you to acknowledge that you've read it, sign the document, and I want you to comply with it. I think the history of the financial services sector is, is quite clear when it comes to people obeying what they've been asked to obey. So I think as auditors, we need to try to understand how can our, our organisations influence the way people behave? In other words, how can we influence the culture of our organization? And I think there's certain pressure points that we can, we can focus on. So as auditors, we tend to look at preventative and detective controls, but ultimately those preventative and detective controls are documented somewhere. So how do I ensure that somebody engages in the preventative and detective control activity that I'm looking for? And the answer is I need to make an overwhelming connection between the person's logical brain and the person's heart. Ultimately, behavior, which is what culture is about, is, is about influencing people's emotions. Something I found quite, quite interesting is the whole world of money laundering. Um, if you say to any human being in, in the financial services sector, do you need to comply with money laundering requirements? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. But can we, can we put that to the test, Liz? Why do you think we have money laundering requirements in a bank? Uh, to make sure that um, people are behaving um, in accordance with legislation and that they are not behaving financial, in a financial, financially questionable way. Okay, let's, let's dig this a little bit deeper. Why, why do we have financial services laws in a society? To make sure that we are comply, well, we, we have laws, we need to comply with those laws uh, to make sure that our society is financially sound and stable. Okay. Um, so far, I don't believe I've said anything to you that's going to get you excited about complying 
with money laundering regulations. So let me try and see if I can provoke a little bit further. And what I'm about to say, some of our viewers may find slightly uncomfortable. Um, what goes wrong in a society when we allow criminals to launder money? Can you give me an example of what might happen in terms of criminal behavior that you would find distasteful? My, um, personally, something that would happen that would mean that um, my life savings disappeared, um, my ability to provide for my child and grandchildren has gone, and the mere fact that someone has felt it appropriate to be able to mislead me, lie to me, deceive me, and therefore deprive me of something. Absolutely. And, and, and we can all relate to how we would feel if somebody dear to our heart lost their life savings. <laughs> Equally, I'm sure we would all hate to think that somebody dear to us was a victim of drugs. Yes. Perhaps their life was blighted by drugs. And yet this is the very reason why we have money laundering regulations. It's the very reason why in the financial services sector, the legal profession, the accounting professions, the estate agency professions, for example, we require people to comply with money laundering regulations. If I really want to influence the way you behave, Liz, or quite frankly, anyone else behaves, if I can make a heart-mind connection, I've got more chance of influencing somebody's behavior which is one of the reasons that I'm a, I'm a big advocate that when we're running training courses, we actually go over the top in explaining to people, why does it really matter that you should comply with what I'm asking you to comply? So for me, one of the first touch points for auditing culture is to look at the quality of what I, I like to call the directive controls. In other words, training. Um, to look at the way organizations make that heart mind connection, because we're trying to influence not computers, we're trying to influence human beings with hearts and emotions. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. And following on that, that line of thought, would that mean then that if you can make that heart mind connection, there is an increased likelihood that people will follow the processes and procedures their organization has put in place? In, in my experience, absolutely, yes. Um, if you look at the great communicators on our planet, they tend to achieve a degree of following by making that, that connection, whether we're talking about politicians, great CEOs, or quite frankly, the head of the training department of Deutsche Bank Group Audit. It's the same concept applies. So something that, that I work quite hard with my team is to make that, that connection using imagery, using pictures, using sometimes quite emotive words. Um, I think by now you've probably worked out that I'm not a believer in giving somebody a, a manual to read and saying, go away and do it, because I don't believe that gets the culture that you're looking for. No, I think that's a, a really good point. And, and I think then you're back to the slavishly following, which is what I said I didn't do. Um, so I, I think always for me, all through my career, my working life, not just in internal audit, I have always had to understand something to enable me to follow whatever I have been asked to do, whether that was training and learning something new or a new process or a new procedure or when I joined internal audit understanding what internal audit was all about I had to understand the why and the how before I could follow it absolutely your your, your um your audit colleague mentions consequences um and and I think as auditors we should get quite excited about auditing consequence management frameworks. Um, let's go back to this analogy of the rebellious human being or, or maybe the rebellious teenager. Uh, if we once again look at the world of banking, 
consequences are very prevalent. Uh, variable compensation, for example, forms a massive role in influencing people's behavior in the financial services sector. But I think we need to be careful when we look at consequences. The, the traditional audit mindset is to, is, to, is to take the view that if, if you do not behave the way I want you to behave, I will dock your pay, I will not promote you, I will take something away from you. In other words, if you don't behave the way I want you to behave, I will do something negative towards you. Um, in other words, I'll create an environment of fear. Now, on the face of it, that seems to be a great way of getting human beings to do what you want them to do. But if we dig into this a little bit deeper, um, fear normally causes the freeze, fight or flight response. If we translate that to the world that we're familiar with as auditors, where there's fear, the human instinct is to potentially try and hide what is actually going on. In other words, a prevalent fear culture eventually leads to fraud, eventually leads to deception, manipulation, and probably leads to the exact opposite of what you're trying to create in terms of a culture, which is why I'm a great fan of looking at positive stimulus as well. In other words, if I'm trying to persuade Liz to behave in a certain way, why don't I reward her, praise her, say nice things, do nice things? I think there's a lot of research. In fact, Deloitte's a number of years ago published uh, um, some research into the, the consequences of a fear culture in the financial services industry, that fear works for a short period of time after which the human condition is to actually rebel. A positive stimulus, when we look at consequences management, is likely to have a, a much more far-reaching change positively in the culture that you're trying to create. So consequences management, for me, is a fascinating area. I, I think it is. And I think, um, I think we've moved forward, haven't we, over time? Um, you know, I remember my parents... Um, when I was a child saying, you know, I, I, I wanted to learn to play a musical instrument. I, I love music. I am absolutely tone deaf, can't carry a tune for love no money. Um, but I still wanted to be able to play something. And I can remember my parents saying to me, no, we are not wasting money because you are absolutely useless at music. And, and therefore that was how I've behaved ever since, that that's formed my entire life. Whereas when I had a son, I did the opposite because I felt that I had been impacted by their behavior. So I encouraged him to do everything. If he'd have said to me, I want to walk on water, I would have encouraged him to find a way to do that. And I wonder if, if that's a generational thing that we have moved forward in terms of, of how it impacts everybody's lives, that positivity message. I hate to generalize about generations, but I think there is a degree of truth in this. If I look at Generation X, I look at millennials, I look at Generation Z, there is certainly more emphasis in the workplace now on praising people, on finding positive role models that one can use to stimulate positive activity. And let's go back to the role of the internal auditor. If I'm engaged in a communication campaign designed to stimulate positive behavior, my, the act of my finding a role model, the act of my communicating what this role model is doing is actually a control activity in my opinion. And I think we should be prepared to audit these communication campaigns um, if for no other reason that they're likely to be successful given that that's the demand of our current modern workplace. So yeah, totally agree Liz. Really good point. Um, and I think you're right, the modern workplace is very different. 
Um, and I think the um, younger, you can tell by looking at me that everybody's younger than me, um, but the younger people coming through, I'm sensing that a lot more, that they are looking for role models, they are looking to be encouraged and engaged rather than told. Absolutely. But th th there is some, some traditional stuff that we can anchor ourselves to, which is tone at the top. Um, to me, there's, there's an overwhelming reason for auditing processes associated with tone at the top. So first of all, what does tone at the top represent? Let's talk negatively first. The person at the top represents power. The person with power potentially has the capacity to create fear and command people's lives. So therefore, the first natural instinct of an employee or a human being is to please tone at the top. On the other hand, tone at the top sometimes is charismatic. I mean, at its worst, you get these cult-like figures that people follow sometimes blindly. Um, I mean, I've always been fascinated by the cult of Steve Jobs, for example, at Apple. But whether you're looking at negative power or you're looking at positive charisma, the processes associated with the magnification of tone at the top are absolutely critical. So let's try and tra translate that to a simple audit program. Number one, what exactly does the person at the very top of the organization wish to say to his or her employees about the behavior that he or she would like to see? In formulating that message, have the organization's values been taken into account? Where there is a disconnect be between some of the organization's values, in other words, that they're not compatible with each other, has the person at the top decided where they want to pitch themselves in terms of that trade-off? How does the person communicate the behaviors they want to see? How does the person then follow up? And this is the bit that we as auditors sometimes don't follow up on. How does the person at the top of the organization then follow up to make sure that the behaviors they want to see are the behaviors that they're actually seeing? The absence of that last step means you can have the most wonderful speeches that are just hot air. So I think there's a lot of good, interesting work that we can conduct as internal auditors in terms of tone at the top. I think that's a really, a really strong message um, there in terms of, I think it's more than just words. I think it's more than just follow up because they could delegate it to internal audit to follow up. This is what I've said, is it happening? Tell me yes or no. Uh, I think there is also more about um, living the values that they are, you know, talking to their staff about. Uh, the tone that they are setting has to be a tone demonstrated by the people at the top with the power because then how do you follow them? How do you, as an organization, you talked about powerful leaders, you talked about charismatic leaders, and I think it's getting that balance right. So a CEO of an organization has to encourage me to follow them because I, what they're saying, heart and mind again, but also I see them living what they're talking about. So it's not that old adage, you know, do as I say, not as I do, but actually they're living and believing what they're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely, Liz. What, what worries me, though, is sometimes, I hope I don't sound arrogant, but I feel like a sort of lonely voice in, 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 in the wind. Um, it would be interesting if we conducted a survey at the moment and asked people, do you believe audit has a fundamental role to play in the world of culture? What response we would get? My, my guess is that a large proportion of people would say that culture is too too amorphous a subject, too vague a subject to command any meaningful internal audit attention. I don't know what your view is. I totally disagree with that view. Uh, I think that the value 
that internal audit can bring to um, the, the culture and how we as an organization live our values and provide that level of assurance to the CEO, the board, the audit committee, in terms of, you know, is it working? The culture they've set, is it working for this organization? Is it helping us deliver our strategic objectives? Is it, you know, going to mean that we are going to be sustainable moving forward? And I have always, and, and I read this, must be donkey's years ago now, I read a story about uh, President J.F. Kennedy and he'd been to NASA uh, and he was being shown round and, you know, given all of the, the wonderful story about NASA. So it must have been 63, 64, or maybe slightly before that, early 60s. And he met this guy, they were walking down a long corridor and he met this guy sweeping the floor. And he said to this guy, what's your job then? And, and when somebody was telling me this story, I thought was well, a stupid question to ask. Obviously, his job's sweeping the floor. And the guy responded by saying, I put a man on the moon. That's the culture I've always wanted. Absolutely. That's an example. I mean, if, if we, let's, let's just trans... Let's just translate. Um, can you hear me again, Liz? Um, te technology is always fun sometimes. Yes, my... I, I can hear you absolutely. Um, if we can just translate what must have happened in, in NASA. Somebody somewhere has either run a training program, given a speech that's impacted the heart of the janitor, and made a connection between the janitor's heart, the janitor's brain, and the mission of NASA, which was to put a man on the moon. That didn't happen by accident, which is why I'm convinced that we as auditors have got a role to play in looking for these communication mechanisms. Where I think we've got a decision to make as a profession is do we want to have the courage to raise audit findings when we don't find these communication mechanisms. That, that strikes me as quite an unusual audit finding. And I know my work is done when those audit findings start to become routine. That, that's a, a really good point, um, Sandra. Can I just interrupt you a second and do a, a just a reminder what we're talking about today if someone's just joined us? Um, so can I welcome you to our live stream, Talk to Internal Audit. Today's session is about auditing culture, a practical hands-on session with myself and Sandro Boeri, Head of Staff Development and Culture Assessments at Deutsche Bank. Auditing culture can be quite daunting. Breaking it down, as Sandro is doing, is a really useful way to tackle it, perhaps in bite-sized chunks. In addition to auditing culture, our, re re uh, sorry, our recent thought leadership report, Mind the Gap, looked at auditing cyber culture. This can help build your confidence to then look more holistically at the topic while adding value by looking at areas of high risk. So, Sandra, going back to, to you, uh, can we perhaps look at the auditing culture map? that you kindly shared at a recent Heads of Internal Audit session? Absolutely. Can I invite you to pick a word from that map, perhaps, Liz? Oh, pick a word. Can I pick culture trumps control? <laughs> OK. Um, what did I mean by those words? The, the environment in which people operate has a massive impact on the way people behave. If we tie that word behavior to conduct, to control activity, the environment in which people operate has a massive impact on compliance with good controls. So therefore, as, as an audit profession, we, we've got a choice. We can ignore the environment in which people operate or we can embrace it. I'm a great believer we should embrace it. So 
I'm, I'm a great believer that we should do a number of things. We should try and measure the climate in which human beings operate. And for more advanced cultural auditors, we should look at control processes surrounding the creation and maintenance of that, that climate. Let me give you a very simplistic example. Uh, speak up culture. Everyone says that we should have a psychologically safe climate in which our employees can flourish. So as an auditor, should we not gauge whether we have a psychologically safe environment? How do we do that? Well, you, you can do that by using interviews, focus groups, um, surveys, probably in that order. You can do that then by triangulating data. In other words, what I've been told during a focus group in terms of the environment that allows me to speak up is that environment supported by what I'm actually seeing in terms of my day-to-day -day auditing. I actually believe there is a room for an audit function to comment as to whether we have a psychologically safe environment or not. We can go beyond that then, and we can actually look at control processes that are attached in creating a psychologically safe environment. In other words, how do we create a positive environment about whistleblowing? Remember, whistleblowing equals the environment of the snitch. Okay, so how can we positively role model the snitch into actually, no, that's our role model positive employee. That's the person that we want. This is how we reward this behavior. Let's tell some stories. Let's encourage people. Let's have positive consequences. Let's make it safer to snitch, if you'll permit me to use that expression, as not to snitch. So I'm just trying to give you a feel for why I believe culture trumps control and that's a, a really good explanation i quite like the um the climate you talked about the climate of the organization and measuring that, that climate um I, I think that's quite a an interesting way um to look at it and i think and, and you know maybe you'll disagree with me but i think internal audit in the fact that we sort of stand back slightly from the organization allows us to observe what is going on within the organization and therefore enables us to contribute to assessing the climate the nature of the organization and and how it is behaving so i, I really like that idea that concept around that i thought that was really positive i'm also a huge fan of speak up policies i really don't like whistleblowing policies because i think you're right it's the conversation we had earlier whistleblowing feels negative i'm going to tell tales on my colleagues where speak up does i think imply that i'm wanting the best for the organization and my colleagues and i've seen something that concerns me that I think we can do better. I, I actually love, um, if you look at some of the agile audit methodologies that we're starting to see, which is essentially is the, the translation of agile concepts into the internal audit workplace. But a critical element of agile is the concept of retrospection. It's the concept of reflect, review, revise. Now, if that's done properly, it's an opportunity built into everything an organization does to actually invite everyone around a table, virtual or otherwise, to share their view as to how well did we did and did we do, what can we do better? Now that's not whistleblowing, that's embedding feedback into everything an organization does. But once again, do we as a profession have the courage to raise an audit finding? we can't see any evidence of these type of retrospective processes, because that's where I think we need to, to get to. I think that's a really good point, but I think isn't it about internal audit now being braver, having more courage, and you know our, our days of 
working our way through 250 invoices to make sure they'd been authorized and the, the maths was correct and the VAT was correct, I think now have diminished because I think we can use technology to help us there, data analytics to do all of that. Our role now is to be brave enough, and we talk about it a lot as internal auditors, as institute, you know, about speaking truth to power. So when we're seeing things that are not right, that don't sit with what the, the board thinks is happening within the organization, then absolutely we must have the courage to stand up and be countered. But I think I think we should be a little bit pragmatic. I mean, I'm I'm conscious that we're talking to people that work in small audit functions, large audit functions, all shapes and sizes. Um, an auditor that's never acted, interacted with culture suddenly turning up at the office on a Monday morning and saying to their boss, guess what, I'm going to audit culture this week, is probably going to freak people out. I would encourage everyone on this call to consider putting in place uh, a route map for themselves in terms of auditing culture. So how can you modestly start? Where do you want to get to? The modest start for me should be looking at what you do at the moment and starting to perhaps tweak your audit functions in your audit findings, sorry, in a way where you're starting to talk a little bit more about the human behavioral dimension without necessarily talking about human behavioral controls. I've given you some examples, training, consequences, management, perhaps tracking tone at the top. But I'd like to think that we can all move towards a destination where we're all measuring the culture that we see. Now, we can put in place some quite robust quantitative measurement metrics. Um, alternatively, we can just give ourselves permission to comment on the culture that we see during our verbal presentations to our chairs of audit committees and so on. I hope we can all see as an end destination auditing human behavioral controls. Um, so there's a challenge there on, on all of us to develop a route map that will require a degree of courage, but one that I believe is absolutely necessary for our professionalism. I absolutely agree with you. And um, do I get to choose another phrase from your map now? because the next one I was going to think about was cultural pressure points. And I think that might sit nicely with what you've just been talking about. Yeah. Um, when I talk about cultural pressure points, I, I, I envisage some touch points that have a fundamental impact on the, the end culture of the organization. So let's start at the front door. The people we let into our organizations or welcome into our organizations have a massive impact on the culture of our organizations. That perhaps is an invitation to look at the design effectiveness and operating effectiveness of our recruitment related controls. So, in other words, when we are vetting people, when we're conducting our due diligence on people that we are thinking of recruiting, do we actually build into those vetting processes some assessments of the value system and belief system of the people we're recruiting? So that's the first pressure point. Secondly, the way we recognize and reward people is a pressure point. Um, the way we manage performance is another massive pressure point. So for example, if we turn a blind eye to misbehavior, we're effectively encouraging misbehavior. If, however, we deal with misbehavior and we message it accordingly to people, obviously in a legally sensitive way, then we give strong messages to, to people. So I would invite us to look at these, what I call cultural pressure points. We're already auditing these control processes. Perhaps let's look at them through a slightly different lens. Good point there. Um, yes, and I think that it, it would be helpful if we look at things through different lenses. And I think that goes back to, you know, the point I was making about us being more courageous, braver as we move forward as a profession 
in that you know we we need to we need to challenge ourselves in terms of what we're doing and how we are doing it to enable us to really deliver what the organization is looking for from an internal audit function i think um if i can use an italian expression um I've always seen the internal auditor as a consigliere. What do I mean by that? A, a trusted advisor to, to management. If we look at the, the dynamics of the trusted advisor relationship, the person receiving the advice isn't only interested as to whether the mechanics of an operation are, um, are working properly, but they're also interested in some form of feedback on the people. Um, I know as internal auditors, I was certainly taught as an auditor, comment on the process, don't, don't comment on the person. But I'm just wondering whether that was a wise piece of advice. I'm coming to a conclusion that I, I need to find a way of providing feedback to the people that pay my bills on, on the people, on the way the people behave, on the climate in which people are behaving. So if I'm to actually fulfill that conciliary role, it's critical that I find an objective way of feeding back on the human condition. Absolutely critical. I love the phrase. Um, I remember the Godfather films, so um, I certainly well. <laughs> I certainly love that uh, conciliary uh, term. I'm conscious that you know we have a limited window here, so. Um, can I just pick one more from your uh, map? And can I ask you about measure culture? You've talked a lot about measuring it um, and, you know, some of the elements of measuring culture, measuring control, what we're looking at. Can you give us some top tips around how we might measure control, me measure culture rather, not control? I think, I think we should start with something that we're all familiar with. There are many, many different dimensions to culture. For example, innovation. Um, let's start with something which is probably closer to our heartland. Let's start with risk culture. So let's find a way of measuring risk culture. How do I measure risk culture? I collect data. First of all, I collect data that tells me something about the degree to which people are risk culturally aware and risk and behaving in a in a positive way so simple things authority transgressions misconduct fraud um attrition the, these are all data points that i that i can use to to help me start to measure the culture but we need to differentiate what we're doing to our normal audit product so let's then use this data to cross-examine management so let me give you an example. Mr. Manager, I notice X number of findings in relation to authority transgressions. In other words, your guys are not complying with policies. They're breaching their authorization limits on something. Um, can you explain to me, number one, were you aware of this? Number two, if so, what do you think are the root causes of these authority transgressions? And number three, what are you doing about it? Based on a mixture of quantitative data and qualitative judgment based on these interviews, I then comment. I report on my measurement. Now, there's pros and cons as to the different methodologies there. Um, something I see an awful lot of in my sector is reporting using RAG ratings. In other words, is it red, amber or green? Um, that allows the ability to comment and to feed back in a consistent way. The downside is that when people comment on red risk culture, it causes challenges sometimes. So there's, there's a lot of pushback in our industry at times on RAG rating related to human behavior, something I think we need to overcome at some point in time. But even if we don't want to report using RAG rated systems, we can still collect the data and we can still comment in an informal fashion. We don't have to document and report formally in relation to everything. But 
not to measure for me is a problem. I think as an audit function, we do need to start measuring culture. I would suggest we start with risk culture. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think we need to measure. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning that we've just done a, a report on Mind the Gap about cyber, cybersecurity risk. And one of the things that we identified in there was that people have cybersecurity as a risk on risk registers, but the concept of a culture within your organization around cybersecurity missing. Um, so, you know, we've talked in that report about, you know, how we can build on that uh, as internal auditors and thereby contribute um, to the organization's increased control environment around cybersecurity. So, you know, th there's lots of positivity there and, and I absolutely agree with you. So thank you for that. So. Can I just um, say, if you're just joining us, welcome to our live stream Talk to Internal Audit. Today's session was about auditing culture, a practical hands-on session with guest speaker, Sandro Boeri, Head of Staff Development and Culture Assessments at Deutsche Bank. May I say a huge thank you, Sandro, for everything you've shared with us today. And you've been very challenging, I think as well, but helpful in a challenging way in terms of what we as a profession need to be doing. So really grateful. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And I think there's lots for us all to reflect upon and perhaps to also share with our internal audit colleagues. And the live stream is available afterwards for those of your friends, colleagues, family, um, who may have missed the live version on the Institute's Facebook channel. So you can, watch it later or re-watch re it at some point in the future if you want to reflect a little more on what Sandro's um, session had in terms of where he was coming from, what his thinking was, and also some of the challenge he's given us in terms of what we need to be doing in auditing culture. So huge thank you, Sandro. I hope you've enjoyed your session with us. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, what I would ask you to do is to follow all of the exciting things that the Institute is doing on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube. And please remember that we will be launching our Risk in Focus 2022 report on the 21st of September. So look out for that. It will be on the homepage of our website. You will have access to our latest edition of Audit and Risk magazine, which is also available now on our website. And if you haven't already checked it out, the Institute now has a community hub for all of you to get involved in, a new gateway to all our community-focused activities and endeavors, including our virtual forums, regional network, and opportunities to become a volunteer. You'll also find a list of all of our special interest groups. So if there's anything that particularly piques your interest, reach out. Our community hub is open to all, members and non-members, and draws on our learnings from the COVID-19 period. So watch that space as it continues to take shape over the coming months. There's an audit, auditing culture training course, and it looks at risk and control issues that are increasingly attributed to cultural weaknesses especially in the financial services sector. But the question we ask ourselves as part of that training course is, do we really understand what we mean when we talk about culture? Not just what it is, but what are its drivers? The course will examine what we mean by culture, subculture, and how this differs from behavior, if indeed it does. It will equip audit teams with an ability to critically evaluate those who want to argue that culture can be bottled and managed through surveys and discussion groups, highlighting how easy it could be for audit to get drawn into cultural blind spots, which may limit its ability to be truly independent and objective in this important but complex area. And Sandra talked uh, around a lot of that as we went through um, the, the session this morning. 
For those of you that are interested, there's an article in the July and August issue of Audit and Risk magazine about culture. It's called The Human Factor Auditing Culture. And there's a link to it in the comments section of this, um, this um, Talk to Internal Audit. As we move forward into the future, please don't forget to look out for Talk to Internal Audit. All of our live streams that we did in 2020 can be found on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet watched any, be sure to subscribe. A link to our YouTube channel can also be found in the comments section. And we will continue to share with you our thoughts regarding specific challenges, along with input from colleagues, members and guests. So please stay in touch. Look out for our next session later this month on recruitment and the challenges that the current economic environment is presenting. And there are lots. There are challenges around um, internal audit as a profession in terms of um, vacancies, in terms of internal audit functions, carrying vacancies because they can't recruit the internal auditors with the skill set they need. So lots to think about there. If you have any specific topics you'd like us to cover, please share your thoughts in the comments box. And I'm always happy to take questions via email at liz.sandwith at iia.org.uk. Remember, talk to internal audit, the Institute is listening. So thank you for your time today and stay safe. Bye.